To many of us mountain folk, a horse's breath on a frosty fall morn is temple smoke. His voice, our Gabriel's horn, holding forth as rider neared, more than a mount, not worshipped, but revered. Every man a king, every hillside farm a kingdom. A pioneer's Pegasus, he gave us wings, he gave us freedom. He fights fury, a home sanctuary, feud or faith, with power and grace, blood or wine, he'll take you to the holy place. He will always get you to church on time. There is a passion for these horses and for, you know, the saying, there's nothing so good for the inside of a man as the outside of a horse. And that's still true today. And this breed and this heritage is strong evidence of that. And you know, we didn't have use for trotting horses pulling buggies because we traveled on the trails. We traveled on the trails that the Choctaw made, that the Shawnee made, that the Cherokee made, that before them the Hopewell and the Buffalo made. Those roads were still a way to get around all the way up into the last century. These horses tell us a lot about our forebears and the way they lived. They, they were using horses, um, I mean, they had to pull a plow and they, then they also needed to be easy to ride and they needed to have a lot of endurance to go to court when the court day was held. And that could be uh, a 20 mile ride. We just called them saddle horses or we called them saddlers. I'm very proud of my heritage. I think that you know not only are our horses hardy, I think our people are, <laughs> are hardy too. They've come through a lot. With the uh, Industrial Revolution, more roads were being built, more automobiles were being used, and, and this horse was endangered. It almost went extinct. And then people started realizing they were something special. And uh, we've always known that they were, you know. There ain't many people, unless you just put pure monetary value on it, that would trade a good mountain horse for the best thoroughbred. Not where I'm from, anyway. Where I'm from, we generally don't let our friends ride a trotting horse. Yeah, I don't, I don't smoke tobacco or drink whiskey, so. <laughs> but you know, I know that that's, that's something that Kentucky's known for, so everybody should know about our horses. It's ingrained in the culture of Eastern Kentuckians for centuries and centuries and centuries. My family history shows we did something with horses all the way back to the 12th century. But that's not an unusual story in Eastern Kentucky. Most of us are Scots-Irish. The Scots-Irish patrolled the border between Scotland and Great Britain. They were called the Reavers, and they were the fiercest light cavalry in the world. They were brutal. Uh, they rode Galloways and Hobbies, and these were gated horses, horses that had been descended from the horses of the Vikings when they invaded the British Isles. The history of the gated horse started in Europe and Spain, and Iberia, the African uh, Arab connection, and the people were riding gated horses and they were leading their war horses, which were the draft types, to the place of battle. They, they didn't ride those, those gigantic trotting horses that would, you know, pound the ground. Um, they used the gated horses. The reality is, is that horses do an intermediate gait that divides into one of two things. They either trot, or they do a gait which derives from the pacing gene and various forms of a, of a smooth traveling gait. 
it's uh, uh, no small conjecture is required to uh, see white people that had to go somewhere on a horse, that had to travel 30, 50, 100 miles a day, would preferentially select a horse with a smooth traveling gait. There were gated horses in the Appalachian Mountains as early as 1520, and they stayed here. They didn't leave. There was Spanish settlement in East Tennessee that lasted for years. Some of those Spanish troops just disappeared. Some said they were captured by the Indians. Some said that they were killed. Most likely, I'd say they just partnered up with the Indians. And a palfrey was a, a, a gated traveling horse and quite often you would hear about it in poems like Chaucer of an easy gated horse that uh, women would prefer to ride. But the knights, knights rode them as well. Those palfreys were the ancestors of our, uh, the Hobbies and the Galloways, were the, the, the names of horses that were easy gated that came originally into New England, 16, 1600s. So after the Spanish came, uh, the Native Americans had horses. And the way that these horses got into Appalachia were from well-established routes of commerce that had been here not for centuries, but for 10 and 12,000 years. Those were the highways that brought the treasure of the mountain horse here. Those, those horses were moved to all of the, the islands and horses went back and forth and most notably to Virginia where fast horses were prized and later on they were crossed with thoroughbreds and those horses migrated into were one of the paths for Kentucky and Tennessee. Even after the Spaniards were here, Sir Walter Riley settled Roanoke. I'm sure they had horses. They had the Galloways. They had the Hobbies. But they also had the horses that had been left behind by the Spanish. Other paths were like my ancestors from uh, Reverend James, the Saddlebag pe Preacher, and his family bring him in. When Daniel Boone left North Carolina and came through the Cumberland Gap, I know we like to think that he was on foot, but most likely he was on a square four beat going horse with Spanish and English blood in it. Another way that the horses got here, there was people from back east here, particularly Kentuckians, that would travel to the plains of Texas and capture wild horses. There were the, uh, the Coxes. They went all the way to Texas, rounded up Spanish Mustangs and corrals, green broke them, and carried them back through the Appalachians on horsehair ropes in strings of a hundred or more horses at a time. Well, I'm very proud to be part of Appalachia. I have a great heritage here. My heritage on my great-grandmother's side, uh, a fellow by the name of Crabtree, was one of the first uh, people with Daniel Boone to go into the Cumberland Gap. He was 16 years old at that time. And matter of fact, he was uh, one of the two people that survived the Indian attack uh, where Daniel Boone's oldest son was killed. Well, I think I grew up always knowing how important, I mean, they were, they were always extremely important to our family. Yeah, that, that's what I consider myself at is East Kentucky, Appalachian. It means a lot to me because, you know, that's where my roots is from. My grandfather, my great grandfather, there's a, a house that I was born in. It had never been sold in history. It had been handed down in my generation. And that's the way bloodlines some of these horses. Uh, I've got one mare left that, uh, that bloodline has been in our family for over 100 years. Uh, we had a, a kind of a hard scrabble uh, farm uh, and worked it with mules and horses. I was born here at Smoky Valley um, in a Sears and Roebuck farmhouse in which uh, uh, my father and I were born in the same bedroom. And the site we're sitting on is part of the original Coleman farm. Horses. That's all my family has ever farmed. For generations and generations, that's all we've ever had. 
I've got horse corrals that are over 100 years old. There's still locust posts in the ground with rusty bob wire that my great-grandfather set there 75 years ago. I pick up arrowheads and old money out of our corrals. We've got rich, dark dirt, but we've also got the clay and limestone that not much more than crab apples and briars will grow on. Dad had a lot of uh, uh, health issues. Uh, he got kicked by a mule in the logwoods when he was um, uh, about 40, probably. And uh, it broke a few ribs, but it rolled him over the mountainside and, and he had a rock and um, had 60 some bones broken. And he climbed back up, uh, rode the mules down, hooked it to the wagon and, and drove uh, a jolt wagon home on a gravel road. My great aunt, my granny's sister Lola that I never got to meet, she uh, rode the, the gated horses to the one room schools. She crossed a high water in the winter one time with her horse, got pneumonia and passed away in her 20s. So, you know, that was the kind of lifestyles that, and, and the, the trials and tribulations that people here faced. JB was a miner and he would ride to work very early in the morning and sometimes get back very late at night and he would sleep on the horse and mm -hmm. the horse knew the path to take over the mountain to get JB to work back mm -hmm. and forth to work and one day he rode in very bad weather over to the mine and nobody else showed up for work so by the time he got home he was frozen to the saddle and the kids had to come outside and chip the ice off of his boots so he could get them out of the stirrups. Those were hard times. It was, it was my granny and her sister. Um, they were both school teachers and they rode. My granny talked about riding their horses to the one room schools in the, in the area. And you know, how easy gated they were and how smooth they were and you know, just a pleasure to ride. And they would, of course, you know, have to time hitch them when they got to the schoolhouse and they would stand tied and you know all day and be ready to you know for the trip home and granny said a lot of times the water would be up the you know it would be muddy it would you know there'd be a snow on and you know it was it, it was just their transportation and it was reliable and it was something that you know they they relied on i mean for the the education of eastern kentucky they carried our books they carried our sick they carried our teachers, and they carried our mail. In everyday life, just for a mode of transportation, they were essential. Then you had uh, people made sleds. They made homemade sleds, and they used those. Those were kind of like the pickup truck of the, like today. You, it was just essential. You cleaned out the barn. You harvested your corn, your crops, your hay and everything. And I think about before horse-drawn implements were here, how did people survive? It's amazing. And uh, the horse, they couldn't have had it not been for the horse. Haul in firewood, uh, just every way, anything that you can think of, that horse was essential. Seemed like everybody kind of lived alike, uh, lived, lived kind of hard, you know, and uh, I think that that's the reason why that we've got the breed of horse and better horses because of the poverty and, and the people that kept stallions. They, if the stallion didn't, didn't produce offsprings that would sell, or, 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 or why well, then uh, they didn't keep them. They castrated them, they put them in the plow and went to work. And there wasn't that many, there wasn't that many stallions around, and just the best ones. But people really were particular and kept the, the most. And that's one of the things that's made our mountain horses so great is because selective breeding, utilitarianism, hardship, all those factors come into play for everybody that wanted to breed the most outstanding horse. They were their partners and they were their working partners. A lot of them would breed because they knew their babies would sell, but they could tell you everything about their offspring. They knew their horses. People took a lot of pride in the bloodlines of the horses. 
they would select a stallion. You know, in today's time, they 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 keep stallions, and a lot of them, I, I don't think that they should. Back then, if you had an outstanding horse that had all these characteristics that are so desired, then people would keep them for a stallion, and they would charge a fee. Our breed is what you call a land race breed, which means that geographically it was bred within a geographical area, a small geographical area. Therefore, there was not a lot of outside breeding and the traits remained true through the years, through the breeding. Here in McGoffin County, I think about the different stallions and it was, it was pretty much, it was limited geographically. You had uh, in different regions of the county, a different a horse, and people would ride a long way to breed a mare to a horse. And that's one reason we have the horses that we have in eastern Kentucky right now. It's because we had a land race of horses here. We had horses that were adapted to the environment, horses that were adapted to the purpose. One has to keep a close eye on the term traveling horse. If you needed to go 100 miles between sunup and sundown, you would look for something that would uh, leave you able to walk when you, uh, when you got off that horse at the end of the day. You know, 50 years ago, there were many a road that didn't have gravel on it in eastern Kentucky. There was many a road that wasn't nothing more than a creek bed. We didn't have as much use for cars as early as a lot of cultures and communities did. You know, we didn't have use for trotting horses pulling buggies because we traveled on the trails. Now the unique thing about the, uh, the gait of the uh, uh, mountain horse, uh, running walk is what my dad called it. Um, and most horses have a, uh, between the walk and the canter, they have a trot. When you speed that up a little bit, it's actually a four count beat and you can hear each hoof hit the ground individually. A good run walking horse, he'll barely move you in the saddle. Most of the time, a good four beat eight aid horse hits just like this, just kind of a float, a float. I grew up on a horse, I reckon. Uh, I've been to, I don't remember when I first got on one, but I've told I was two or three years old. I can remember going up the highway in front of my papa's house. It was a, a dirt road for a while and then a black top road. I can still, still hear my papa hollering at me. Max, don't let that horse crow up. Get him in gate. The reason it's smooth, it's always got at least three feet on the ground, right? So it's a ground covering gate. They got, their, they got some speed to them, and there's three feet on the ground. And if, like a if two beat gate, a trot or a pace, a horse has to jump from one side to the other. The greatest pleasure, probably, of being around them was. One, the friendship, you know, the, the kinship, I suppose, would be the greatest. But a close second was the feeling when you're riding them down the blacktop and that nickel dime, nickel dime, nickel dime sound. <laughs> it, it, it's the greatest high in the world. And once you hear it, you can't forget it. <laughs> I don't know if I've got the rhythm to do it. <laughs> When you hear it, you know when you got a good one. Pucka, 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 pucka. That's what you hear when you're going down the road. Sound like a little sewing machine. Well, it's kind of a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Is it? You could hear each hoof hitting the ground uh, individually. So I can still hear how your trade would go. Someone would walk up and look at your horse, maybe lay a hand on it, brush it off a little bit. And they were all shining like new pennies because everybody took pride in them. First thing they would ask is, can that horse saddle? That was the standard first question. And of course he could. There was very few that couldn't. You know, you wouldn't have took him there if they couldn't saddle. The next question was, well, is he gentle? And of course he was. <laughs> 
And then if it got right down to the brass tacks of it and you were trying to negotiate on the price, you'd say, well, does he work? And that doesn't mean was he suited for a particular purpose. What that mean was is could you hitch him to a plow? Would he work in the garden? And that's how the trades went. JB told me, he said, you know, I could get in the saddle and go to sleep and the horse would take me to work. I could come out of the mine, get on the horse, and he would bring me home. He stood tied all day while JB was working, and I'm sure it wasn't just an eight-hour shift. When you talk to the miners, they tell you about working 16 and 18 hours a day underground. So they were very um, much admired for their um, work ethic, the horse and the people, yes. It's kind of like, you know, the people and the horses evolved together to where we are now. I don't, I don't know, I, I, you know, they, can, they come with, with, with that heritage and that history too. I don't know if they know it, but I feel like they do. Do you ever thought how that horse has changed your life? And it has, I mean, I've got, I don't know how many thousand miles I've got on her. I've had her out in the ocean with surfers. I've had her, um, I've had her on places you, no man would take a horse. So they are, they're, these horses would do about anything. They would take you places that a goat couldn't follow you, and with more speed and grace. I spent four and a half years with my best friends and all my riding buddies, the serious hardcore trail riders in Hazard, Kentucky. For years, I tried to get them to, let's do horses. We wanna do Kentucky bred, Kentucky trained, Kentucky horses for people from all over the world to come to and get. After about four and a half years riding with these people and we sort of, we we're still great friends and everything, but I don't get a ride with them as much as I had I, as I used to. Then one one day I realized I am that person. I am from these mountains. I am a mountain person with mountain horses. To ride a real good one, it's no experience like it. I can be aggravated with everything in the world, you know. And we all, as humans, we all get aggravated with things. There's nothing like saddling a horse up, taking your dog. Going across country, riding a good horse, it's just so relaxing. It's just like you ain't got a cure in the world. If you look at the whole state, it's probably one of the best products that's ever come out of the state of Kentucky. What would I say to the next generation? I'd say keep this breed alive. Keep it going. You know, take care of it. I'm so thankful that, you know, the, the, the folks that Dave's talked about had the forethought to, you know, register these horses and start these breed registries because without that, our horses would have went by the wayside. I like nothing better than going to the mountains trail riding, traveling the back roads and the little towns and places in Eastern Kentucky. I was always welcome. They were so appreciative of your interest in their horses. They love to show you their horses. Oh, come and look at this one. And they would tell you the whole lintage on it and what all it had done and where they had gotten their horse. That's where my heart is. People are starting to catch on that if you want the very best trail horse, if you don't want to be beat to death and you want to feel good at the end of your ride, the same as you did when you first saddled that horse, then you need a good mountain horse. Settler in a foreign land with mountains all around. He braved the dangers through the gap for a piece of fertile ground. Weary but not shaken, bound to build a new life. All he owned in a wagon with four kids and a wife. 
He wondered, would they make it there? Would they be so lucky? They put all their faith in God and the horse that built Kentucky.